We're in this series that I'm sort of titling Get Everything You Want, uh, How to Get Everything When You Can Afford Nothing, or My Perfect Wish List, or something random like that. But, but the basic idea is that in our lives, we oftentimes settle for the less because we know the greater is out of reach. For example, when you're a kid and you really want to get that amazing Christmas present, but your parents tell you that they can't afford it, and so you lower your standards to something that Santa can afford. Apparently, you know, when you're supplying toys to the whole world, you have to do things on a budget. So uh, you, you reach that point early on in your life where you recognize you have to lower your standards so that you don't get too disappointed. And in this series of messages, what I'm going to try to do is I'm trying to expand your mindset, especially for Christmas, expand your mindset beyond the point of anything financial. Expand your mindset so that you're not thinking about where my finances limit me, but you're thinking about things that money has absolutely no ability to touch. Things that go beyond that. Things that your heart really, truly wants. Things that you don't really admit when someone asks you what you want for Christmas because they sound too high and mighty, holier than thou, weird, something or other. But you know that that's what your heart wants. Your heart wants peace. Your heart wants joy. Your heart wants love. You need some light in the darkness of your life, and you need some change. You need God to work on some change in your life. You need God to work on some change in the people around you. You need change. And so those are the things we're asking God for this Christmas. If we had a Christmas wish list that we could bring to God and say, God, these are the things on our list, I think they would be it. And so today we're turning to the topic of joy. And if you look on the note sheet there, Luke 2, 10 through 11 we get this passage that we read at Christmas time and we kind of blow over because we've heard it so often and because we're not exactly sure what it means to us. But it says this, the angel speaking to the shepherds says, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Now here's the thing about that passage. The angel doesn't say that down the road you're going, to experiencing, you're going to be experiencing joy. The angel doesn't say that if you meet this baby, he's going to make you happy. He's going to heal your diseases. He's going to make you happy. That's going to give you joy. That's not what the angel says. The angel says, I'm bringing you news of joy. There's something in the message that is itself joy. And that's what we're going to try to unpack this morning. But before we get to that, what I want to do, and I just want to give you this one phrase. You can write it down if you're taking notes. But this one phrase is just basically this. I, this Christmas, can have joy for free. I can have joy for free. I don't have to buy it. I don't have to ask for it from my friends, relatives, neighbors. I don't have to be given a present to get joy. I can have joy for free. I can have it right now, I can have it today, and I can have it every day this week, no matter what stress or frustration I'm going through. That's where we're starting. But if we're going to do that, we have to find the secret of having joy, regardless of circumstances. So if you wouldn't mind, grab your Bibles, turn to Philippians. Uh, the Bibles that we passed out, it's on page 814, and we're going to learn the secrets of joy. Philippians and I want to read the whole book to you this morning, but I can't. I don't have enough time. It, it, it'd take you about maybe seven minutes to read it on your own, maybe ten minutes for me to read it out loud. And I, I just don't have the time this morning because I've got too much stuff I want to talk about. So I'm going to trust you, okay? I'm going to trust that you're going to read Philippians sometime this week, okay? Hopefully soon, while you can still remember some of the stuff we talk about. But Philippians as a book is a book that you have to get the entire picture from beginning to end to get the concept of how you can have joy regardless of circumstances. Today I'm going to try to unpack a few parts of it. I'm going to try to unpack sort of the central core message of it. But I have to trust that you're going to be reading it on your own at least sometime this week. Do you think you could do that? Seven minutes out of your life, I, I know you can do it, you know, during the commercials, t during halftime today. I mean, nothing really... Nothing really good happens at halftime because, you know, you're going to see three or four halftimes if you watch all the football games. So, I mean, hey, only choose one of them, okay? Use the other one for Philippians. Okay, here we go. We're going to start right at the beginning, and I'm going to read 1 through 26. So it's a good section, but not the whole thing. Here we go. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. 
grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for you, for all of you, I always pray with joy. That's the first time you see that word, and it's not the last time you'll see that word. Joy. I pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. For whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I, I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body, convinced of this. I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Let me remind you of the city of Philippi and Paul's relationship.